There are so many facets to the nature and power of the Holy Spirit. And as we go through the scripture, I pray that you see new sides to the Holy Spirit that you've never seen before. We're going to go through the Old Testament and look at the nature, the power, and the person of the Holy Spirit. I'll cover as many as I can. And I want you right now just to ask the Lord to speak to you, to teach you about his precious Holy Spirit, that you might be drawn closer to the Holy Spirit, empowered and transformed. Now, I want to first look at how we see the Holy Spirit in Scripture. We see him specifically mentioned, we see him subtly mentioned, and we see him symbolically mentioned. By that I mean, for example, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he is specifically mentioned, but you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So there it's very obvious that the Holy Spirit is being mentioned. And then sometimes he's subtly mentioned, like, for example, in Isaiah 6. We wouldn't know that it was the Holy Spirit specifically speaking to the prophet Isaiah unless we took that particular portion of Scripture and then compared it or cross-referenced it with Acts chapter 28, where it is then revealed that it was the Holy Spirit himself who was speaking to Isaiah the prophet. So that is a subtle mention. And then there are symbolic mentions of the Holy Spirit. Now, I may take another time to specifically go through as to why these are all symbols of the Holy Spirit. But for the time being, for the sake of this message, I'll just mention right now the nine symbols of the Holy Spirit throughout Scripture. Fire, water, wind, the dove, the seal, wine, light, the cloud, oil. Do me a favor, help the community. Leave that in the comment section for me. Now, these particular manifestations, or I should say symbols of the Holy Spirit's presence, aren't necessarily always referenced to him. So, for example, in the scripture, sometimes fire is just fire, sometimes water is just water, sometimes wind is just wind. But as you look at the context of the scripture that you're reading, you'll actually be able to see with careful study if one of these are actually a symbol for the presence of the Holy Spirit. So with that being said, let's go through the Old Testament here and look at the presence of the Holy Spirit. Let's start with Genesis chapter 1. You know, you can't even get to verse 2 without seeing the precious Holy Spirit in Scripture. Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered deep waters. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Verse 3, then God said, let there be light, and there was light. I want you to picture this. The person of the Holy Spirit hovering over that darkness, hovering over that void. Now, the word here for hovered can be translated to brooded. In other words, brooded as in a, a bird that incubates its eggs, brooding over. So there we get a picture of a bird-like creature or the dove, the Holy Spirit hovering over the emptiness, hovering over the darkness. And then God speaks a word and creation manifests. Here we see from the very beginning the partnership between word and spirit. Now we have to be careful because often we imagine that the word contradicts the move of the spirit and the spirit contradicts the word. Now we don't say that outright, do we? We don't say, well, the Holy Spirit can't work with the word and the word can't work with the Holy Spirit. But even though we don't say that outright, we actually reveal that we believe this in a subtle way when we say things like this, that service was so powerful, he didn't even preach a sermon, God just moved. Or the revival meeting was great, she just tore up her notes, didn't say a scripture, and went right into the miracles. Now granted, there are times when the Lord will lead you to just move right into the prophetic or right into praying for the sick. It's not always going to follow a specific order that you expect. But for the most part, you have to understand that the word is not an obstacle to the Holy Spirit moving. The word is the foundation to the move of the Holy Spirit. You can actually see this in services. There are sometimes maybe you'll go to a service and there are demonstrations of power, miracles, the prophetic healing, deliverance. But you know something's missing. There's a substance that's not quite there. There's, there's not a weight of the glory and the beauty of the Lord on that meeting, and you can't really quite put your finger on it. Often it's because the word was neglected. So here we see the Holy Spirit hovers. 
the Father speaks and creation comes into existence. When the Word and Spirit come together, that's when you have creation. When the Word and the Spirit come together, that's when there is substance. When the Word and the Spirit come together, that's when you have transformation. There are some believers who neglect the Word of God and think that all they need is the Holy Spirit. And because they neglect the written Word of God, which, by the way, the Holy Spirit inspired, they get really weird. They get really strange. They start to embrace some doctrines that are not even in Scripture that even contradict the nature of God. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we get some believers who are all theology, all intellect, and there's nothing wrong with theology. In fact, I believe that revelation is knowledge set on fire by the Holy Spirit. You ought to know the Word with a sharp mind. You ought to know the Word in great detail. But sometimes we rely so much on intellect that we neglect moves of the Spirit because we kind of snub our nose at it or we look down upon it or we we condescend to it because we think that we've arrived at some place where we don't need encounters with God. No, you need both. You need both the Word and the Spirit moving together. And we see that partnership there uh, with the Holy Spirit hovering. Genesis 1-2, he hovered over the face of the deep. I want you to leave in the comment section right now these, the, the simple phrase, right? Word and Spirit. And I want you to make a commitment that you're going to be balanced. That you're not just going to be all study and you're not just going to be all spontaneous, but that you're going to embrace both the power and person of the Holy Spirit as well as the written Word of God. And in that, you will see true substance, true power, true transformation. So write that in the comment section right now, whether you're watching live or replay, Word and Spirit. In Genesis 17, 5, some of these, by the way, we're not going to go to. I'll just reference briefly. This is one of those. In Genesis 17, 5, we see that the name Abram was changed to Abraham. Now, if you study the name Abraham and you study the name Abram and the difference between the two, you will find that there is a breath sound that's created there. So Abram, Abraham, that's the breath of God. So that ha, that, that breathy sound that's a representative of the Ruach, which is the breath of God, the wind of, of heaven, the, the spirit of the Lord. So in that breath, there was a transformation in name. That right there alone is a whole message unto itself. In the breath of the spirit, there's a transformation in his name. There's a transformation in his nature. There's a transformation in his spiritual position. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He is the name changer. In Genesis 41, 38, go there now. Genesis 41, 38, we see that he was the same spirit who was in Joseph. And this, by the way, was a statement made by Pharaoh after Joseph had interpreted his dreams. Verse 38, so Pharaoh asked his officials, can we find anyone else like this man? So obviously filled with the spirit of God. Now, here we see this is the spirit of the dreamer. So the Holy Spirit was present in the Old Testament. Many times believers imagine that the Holy Spirit showed up in Acts chapter 2 or that that's when he started his work. But as we're about to see, he is found all throughout the Old Testament, his presence, his power, his nature, even the implication of his presence in some instances. And so this is the spirit of the dreamer within Joseph. The Holy Spirit gave to Joseph the power to interpret those dreams. That was a prophetic gifting on his life, and Pharaoh recognizes that. He's the fire of evangelism in Exodus chapter 3, verse 2. Think about the fact that fire, being a symbol of the Holy Spirit, was something that Moses encountered when he looked at the burning bush. Now, when you've come into contact with the presence of the Holy Spirit, within you is kindled a passion for lost souls. So that's why I call him the fire of evangelism. Think about this. After Moses has his encounter with the Holy Spirit, now he has a burden for God's people. And in the same way, when you and I have an encounter with the Holy Spirit today, we have a burden for the lost. He's the precious oil in Exodus chapter 30, verses 22 through 25. He's the expert spirit. I love this one. Let's go, let's go look at this one. Exodus 31. Exodus 31, and I'm going to read verses, let's go 1 through 6. Then the Lord said to Moses, Look, I have specifically chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, grandson of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. I have filled him with the Spirit of God, giving him great wisdom, ability, 
and expertise in all kinds of crafts. He is a master craftsman, expert in working with gold, silver, and bronze. He is skilled in engraving and mounting gemstones in carving wood and in carving wood. He is a master at every craft. Moreover, I have given special skill to all the gifted craftsmen so they can make all th- all the things I have commanded you to make. So here, as they're receiving instructions, where Moses is receiving instructions to have the tabernacle and its various items constructed and created, God says to him, I've given to you for this purpose craftsmen. Now, this is interesting to me because this revealed something about the nature of the Holy Spirit that many believers often overlook. You see, we understand that the Holy Spirit can empower us for the prophetic or can empower us for discernment or can empower us for healing or can empower us to practice deliverance ministry. And these are all wonderful attributes of the Holy Spirit's nature. But think about the fact that not only does the Holy Spirit empower us unto the supernatural, he also empowers us unto the practical. Who would have thought that the Holy Spirit's power upon someone would give them the ability to craft and to create and to work with wood and to work with metals and to work with materials? That right there is a demonstration to us that the Holy Spirit is available to help us in our everyday lives. The Holy Spirit didn't only come upon the church to empower pastors, evangelists, teachers, apostles, and prophets. The Holy Spirit came upon the church to empower parents and children and students and teachers and business people and workers. He empowers you unto the practical. There's no task so big that the Holy Spirit cannot do it through you. And there's no task so small that the Holy Spirit won't make himself available to help you. He will help you in every detail of your life. Doesn't the scripture say that? He delights in every detail of your life. May we welcome him in our lives to empower us unto the practical. In Leviticus 9.24, we see that he is the sovereign fire. Remember, fire is one of the symbols of the Holy Spirit. What's interesting here is that the priests were told to sustain the fire. They were told to never allow the fire to go out. Keep it burning. But notice that they did not start the fire. So picture this. God says, keep the fire burning. It must never go out. Do what you must to maintain that flame. But then the fire came from a heavenly place. The fire came from a divine source. The fire came from God himself. So this represents to us the partnership that we have with the Holy Spirit. We cannot start moves of the Holy Spirit, but we can steward them. We cannot begin a work of God, but we can surrender to a work of God. We can't force God to do what he does not want to do. But once he does move, we do have the opportunity to partner with him in those moves. Now, God doesn't need us, but he chooses to partner with us here in the earth. God can work without us, but he chooses to involve us in what he does on this side of eternity. And so may we honor that partnership with the Holy Spirit in our lives. For example, the Holy Spirit will give you the desire to pray. You must choose to enact the discipline to pray. Partner with the Holy Spirit. He's the sovereign fire. Leviticus 24.2, we see that he's the pure oil. In Numbers chapter 11, verse 17, he's the spirit of impartation. And I will put my spirit upon them also. You know, impartation doesn't come from man, it comes through man, but it comes from God. Now, some have suggested, strangely so, that the concept of impartation is not a biblical one. Whenever we talk about impartation, all we're talking about is the influence of God that comes through a human being touching the life of another. Authority can be imparted by God's will. Power can be imparted by God's will. Teachings can be imparted by God's will. Wisdom can be imparted by God's will. He uses individuals to give to us these things, not from those individuals, but through those individuals. And looking at that simple definition of impartation, we see clearly that that is a biblical concept. And this is one of the things we see here, that the Spirit of God comes upon them also. He's the Spirit of impartation. He is the one who gives mantles and positions and gifts and authority and assignments and so forth. He's the different spirit. Go to Numbers 14. This is another one of my favorites. We could do a a sermon on each one of these. But as I said, we'll do as many as we can here. 
number. Let me know. Are you enjoying this so far? Tell me so far what your favorite one is in the comments. Uh, numbers 1424. Numbers 1424. But my servant Caleb has a different spirit than the others have. He has remained loyal to me, so I will bring him into the land he explored. His descendants will possess their full share of the land. Twelve spies, ten gave a bad report, two gave a good one. And Caleb gave that good report. Why? There was a, there was a different spirit in him. There was something that God had placed in him by the Holy Spirit that gave him eyes of faith. Here's what I love about Caleb is that when others saw impossibility, he saw opportunity. When others looked and dismayed, he looked at God and believed. When others saw the problem, he saw God's power. May we have that different spirit within us. Now, of course, this is not a direct reference to the Holy Spirit, but it is a reference to the spirit in which he was operating. And we understand that the Holy Spirit is the one who influences our spirits to obey and do as God desires. So here we see a subtle work of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit was producing faith even in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit was producing that hope, that, that ember, that fire, that brings one to belief in God's power. May we have that different spirit when we approach the seemingly impossible. May we have that different spirit when we want to quit, when we want to give up, when we get so frustrated because we just don't see things working out the way we want them to work out or in the timing we want to see them work out. May we have that different spirit. He was the spirit in Joshua, Numbers 27, 18. He was the fire by night and the cloud by day, Deuteronomy 1, The oil of prosperity, Deuteronomy 33, 24. The spirit of breakthrough, Joshua 6, 3-5. Remember I talked about that word ruach. That can mean spirit, wind, or breath. Notice then that when the children of Israel had marched around the walls of Jericho, they were told to shout or breathe, to release that breath of the spirit. Think about the fact that it was the power of God that, ca that caused the walls of Jericho to fall like water. And also that same power that caused the waters to stand up like walls. It was the breath of God. The scripture says the breath of his nostril. He released that breath and the sea stood at attention. That it, that it parted ways so that the children of Israel could walk through. So that breath makes the walls fall like water and the, the water rise like walls. The spirit of breakthrough. He makes a way where there seems to be no way. He clears a path where there looks like there's no path. The spirit of discernment. Joshua 7, 16 through 19. We know the story of Achan's tent. They found sin in the camp. How did they find that sin in the camp? It was through the direction of the Holy Spirit. He's the spirit of leadership. Judges 3.10, the Holy Spirit would come upon them so that they could lead. The fire from the rock, Judges 6.21. The spirit of conquest, Judges 11.29. The spirit came on him and he led an army against the Ammonites. The fire of heaven, Judges 13.20. The spirit of supernatural strength. I love this. Judges 14, 6. Just as he gave supernatural physical strength to Samson. So he gives supernatural strength of all sorts to you. He gives you that mental strength, that emotional strength, that spiritual strength. Just when you think you've given all that you had, the Holy Spirit comes to strengthen you and help you keep moving forward. The gentle spirit. Judges 16, 20. He didn't realize that the Lord had left him. Now, I want to be careful with the way I describe this because especially when looking at Old Testament instances, we have to be careful to filter them through properly New Covenant perspective. We understand that the Holy Spirit does not leave a genuine born-again believer just because they make a mistake. And so here, I believe this is speaking more to the manifestation of that power or the intensity of his influence. He didn't realize that he didn't have the ability what he, to do what he did before. So he's that gentle spirit. You know, you look at Acts chapter 2, and he comes upon the church like a mighty rushing wind. But here in Judges 16, 20, he leaves as a whispered breath. The Holy Spirit has an announced arrival, but a quiet leaving. Now, I don't say that he leaves you in the sense that he abandons you or that he no longer dwells within you. I say that in the sense that he removes his influence from certain aspects of our lives when we walk in compromise. And of course, he'll convict us. He'll still speak to us. 
and try to help us correct that. And eventually God will bring correction and judgment upon disobedience. But he is patient with us. So often we miss that, though. He arrives as a mighty rushing wind, but his influence is minimized as a whispered breath. And we don't even recognize it sometimes. We don't even recognize sometimes when the Holy Spirit has decreased his influence in our lives. We don't even recognize it when the Holy Spirit removes his hand from something that we're in. Here's the thing about the Holy Spirit is he will sometimes allow you to continue on the path where you're stubbornly walking so that that can ultimately bring correction. He's humble like that. He'll whisper, he'll convict, he'll correct, of course. But many people don't even realize when he's not in something anymore. And here's the sad truth. We are so self-reliant these days. We are so reliant upon programs. We are so reliant upon intellect. We are so reliant upon skill that often we don't even recognize the Holy Spirit having lifted his influence. In fact, were the Holy Spirit to remove himself from churches in America or around the world, many churches wouldn't even realize that he left because they're so self-reliant. He's the kind spirit of adoption, Ruth 2.21 Boaz is a type of Christ, and wherever you see a type of Christ, you can see a type of the Spirit. The appointing Spirit, 1 Samuel 10, 1, 16, 1, and 16, 13. He's the Spirit who speaks through you, 2 Samuel 23, 2. I like this. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. I want to show you something. Watch this here. 1 Kings 19. I'm going to read beginning at verse 11. Go and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. On a side note, that's another example of where wind is just wind, because here it clearly outright says the Lord was not in the wind. And the earthquake, and after the earthquake, there was a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And a voice said, what are you doing here, Elijah? So the voice of the Holy Spirit here wasn't in the wind, wasn't in the earthquake, wasn't in the fire. It was a still, small voice. This again speaks to the gentle nature of the Holy Spirit. Yes, there is a facet to his being where he's firm, where he's direct, where he's stern with us sometimes. But there's also this gentle side to him. And what I found interesting about this is that if God was in the wind, if the Holy Spirit was in the wind, Elijah would have had no choice but to be moved by the wind. If the Holy Spirit was in the earthquake, Elijah would have had no choice but to be moved, to be shaken by the earthquake. If the Holy Spirit was in the fire, Elijah would have had no choice but to be warmed or burned by that fire. But the Holy Spirit was not in the wind. He was not in the earthquake. He was not in the fire. He was in the still small voice. And because he was in the still small voice, Elijah had a choice to listen and obey. So the Holy Spirit isn't going to always blow you away, shake you up, or burn you, or warm you against your will, or force you to do things. The Holy Spirit will speak, thus giving you a choice. He's the pervasive oil, 2 Kings 4, 1-7. The heavenly wind, 2 Kings 2.11. A kindred spirit, 1 Chronicles 12.18. When David was running from Saul and his camp was approached by men he did not recognize, David didn't know whether or not he should allow those men to enter the camp. But then the Holy Spirit comes upon them. They begin to prophesy, and then he knows that he should allow them in his camp. You know, the Holy Spirit will reveal to you who you should and should not have around you. Think of what great advantage you and I have in being friends of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit hears conversations you do not hear. The Holy Spirit sees motives you do not see. The Holy Spirit sees thoughts you do not see. The Holy Spirit knows the hearts and the intents of the people around you. And he can tell you in your spirit whether or not someone should be connected to you. Listen to that voice. I can't tell you how many times when I was meeting someone or working with someone, the Holy Spirit would give me a check in my spirit, as many say. There was this inner knowing, an inner witness that something was off there. And in responding to the voice of the Holy Spirit, 
I was spared of many troubles because it would turn out that these people were really not for me or for the Lord even. And so the Holy Spirit is that kindred spirit. You'll recognize it. I've, I've been out sometimes, for example, I'll be at the grocery store or maybe at the gas station and maybe I'll strike up a conversation with someone and every so often I can tell and I'll say, you're a Christian, aren't you? And they'll say, yes, how did you know? I say, I don't know. There's just a kindred spirit. Maybe that's happened to you before. Let me know if it did, where you, you're, you're, you're talking with someone. Maybe you meet someone on the street or in a classroom or whatever setting it is, and you just know in your spirit, this person is a Christian. You can sense it. That's the kindred spirit. Maybe even you can sense that connection here, where there's this kindred spirit that you and I have because we're both of the Holy Spirit. The fortifying spirit. Second Chronicles 15, 1 through 4. He, he, Asa was reminded to rid the land of idols. That's what the Holy Spirit will do. Even when you're walking as you should walk, even when you are where you should be spiritually, the Holy Spirit will still nudge you along and say, hey, let's keep things in order here. Let's not just grow comfortable. He'll nudge you to remove any compromise remaining. He's the convicting spirit, Ezra 10, 1, the comforter. Just take a look at the meaning of Nehemiah's name. He's the good spirit in Nehemiah 9.20. You sent your good spirit to instruct them. What is good? It's talking about moral excellence, uprightness. He's the voice of destiny in Esther chapter 4, verses 13 through 14. Also, I believe he's symbolized in the king's signet that seal for the salvation of God's people is prophetic in the book of Esther. He's the life-giving spirit in Job 33.4. He's the spirit of worship in Psalm 51.11 the oil of honor, the oil of joy, the oil of favor in Psalm 23, 5, 45, 7, and 84, 9. He's the spirit of wisdom. I can sense an anointing even as I'm talking right now. He's the spirit of wisdom in Proverbs 1, 20 through 23. He's the spirit of purpose, eternity in our hearts, Ecclesiastes 3, 11. He's the hidden dove, Song of Solomon 2, 14. The generational spirit, Isaiah 44, 3. The Spirit upon Jesus, Isaiah 61, 1. He's the fire in your bones, Jeremiah 20, verse 9. He's the one who grieves over sin, Lamentations 2, 11. He's the life of the heavenly beings, Ezekiel 1, 20 through 21. He, I believe, is the fiery being in Ezekiel chapter 1, excuse me, chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. Notice that the scripture describes this being of fire there. And then it says, the spirit took me by the hair after describing that being. He's the man of fire, the book of Ezekiel. He's the giver of spiritual visions, Ezekiel eleven twenty four. The spirit of oneness, Ezekiel 36, 25 to 27. And I will give you a new heart and I will put my spirit in you. That's what the scripture says. The excellent spirit in Daniel 5, 12. The patient spirit in Hosea 2, 14. The promise of the Father in Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 31. The consuming fire, Amos 5, 4 through 6. The vindicating fire, Obadiah 1, 18. The protector of the call, Jonah 1, 4. The unchanging spirit, Micah 2, 7. The spirit of warning, Nahum 1, 6. The spirit of indignation, Habakkuk 1, 13. The spirit of hope, Zephaniah 3, 14 through 15. Is the enemy of fear in Haggai 2.5, the spirit of grace in Zechariah 12.10. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Don't ever let anyone tell you that he's not the spirit of grace. It says it outright in the scripture. Finally, in Malachi 3, and this is where I really want to spend just a little more time with you here. Malachi 3, I'm going to read verses 1 and 2. Look, I am sending my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. Then the Lord you are seeking will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant, whom you look for so eagerly, is surely coming, says the Lord of heaven's armies. But who will be able to endure it when he comes? Who will be able to stand and face him when he appears? For he will be like a blazing fire that refines metal, or like a strong soap that bleaches clothes. There we see again that symbol of fire. The Holy Spirit is the refiner's fire. Think about the fact that John, when describing Jesus, he talked about Jesus baptizing you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He's the refiner's fire, puts you on that threshing floor. 
and removes the chaff and burns it away. He purifies you. And he removes those things from you that are not like Jesus, that need to be removed. That's who the Holy Spirit is. Now, I cover all of these in great detail in a book I wrote called Encountering the Holy Spirit in Every Book of the Bible. And I actually go through Genesis all the way to Revelation. And I give great detail on each one of these and more that I mention. But I want you to take what you've just received. And I know you were given a lot here, but I want you to take maybe one or two revelations and hold it close just for the next few days. I'm serious. I want you to do this. I know just ignore the flesh right now. The flesh wants to click on something else, maybe watch something entertaining. This is edifying. This is for your spirit. I want you to make a commitment to take one or two of those truths and just hold them close to you. You say, David, what do you mean by that? I mean, you hold them close to you and just think about it again and again. Maybe you see them as the refiner's fire. Maybe you see them as the spirit of excellence, the spirit of the dreamer. Maybe you see them as the one who works with the word, whatever it may be. Just hold that revelation close. Appreciate that aspect of the Holy Spirit's nature and ask him to give you encounters with him reflect that aspect of his nature. I believe he's caused certain things in this message to stand out to you for a reason. So, Father, I pray you help him do it. Be our constant reminder. Let us sense you in the room with us now. Thank you for your presence and power, precious Holy Spirit. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. I want you to say because you believe it, say and type. Amen. If you enjoyed that, leave a like so others can see it. Subscribe to my channel so that we can stay connected and you can continue to receive my teachings on the Holy Spirit. And now, before you close out this video, I want to ask you to become a monthly ministry supporter of this ministry if your life has been impacted. I know you're generous. I know you love the gospel. I know you love Jesus. So I'm asking you to go with me to the nations. You say, what do you mean go with you to the nations? Well, you as someone who prays for this ministry, as someone who gives to this ministry, Everywhere I go in the Spirit, you're going with me. Everything I do in the Spirit, you're doing it with me. We are co-laborers in the gospel. And so if you have a passion to see people saved, healed, delivered, and empowered, join this movement. Get behind what God is doing. That's what we have, really. We have a Holy Spirit movement that's very unique, and God is doing something quite special through His ministry. It's not my ministry. It's His, and I'm just a steward of this ministry. And I want you to partner with this ministry so that you can be involved with, God is, with, with, with what God is doing. Maybe you've been blessed and you've been watching for a while or you've attended an event. You've been blessed to this ministry in some way. I'm going to ask you now, will you pay that forward? Will you take that step of faith? Look, I know it's challenging for many to take a step of faith and to give, but I want you to say no to fear. I know there's that grip, right, sometimes that we feel. Let go. Step out in faith and watch what the Lord will do as you obey the Holy Spirit. Do not ignore the voice of the Holy Spirit. When you step out in faith, just watch what the Lord will do for you. He's going to take care of you, and I believe he will increase you, that he might produce a harvest of generosity in you. So partner today. For a, for a monthly partnership, go to davidhernandezministries.com slash partner. Think of all of the things that we spend our money on, and even in some instances, if we're being honest, things we waste our money on. Think about what we pay on monthly subscriptions and entertainment and going out and having fun. I'm not saying you can't do those things, but won't you also consider doing that for the gospel? Consider becoming a partner with this ministry for $10 a month, $25 a month, $50 a month. Some can do $100 a month, but go right now. Ask the Holy Spirit, what do you want me to do? And go to davidhernandezministries.com slash partner. You can also give a single gift by going to davidhernandezministries.com slash donate. We accept gifts from all different countries in all kinds of different currencies, even cryptocurrency. Do try the website first, and then if those options don't work on the website, you can give through Facebook or YouTube, but try the website first. Go and do that today. I so appreciate it. Thank you for your giving. I love you, and I pray for you. Until next time, remember, nothing is impossible with God.